Okay, hey guys, how are you doing today? Welcome to the live chat, um, lay live chat. Um, happy Martin Luther King Day to everybody. Um, I'll wait for like a couple minutes to let everybody get on um, and get everybody going kind of deal. And I guess I'll sort of start, I've got four, I kind of condensed everybody's questions that they sent to me, great questions by the way. Um, I kind of condense everybody's questions down to sort of four questions and we'll sort of work from there. And I think it'll keep me pretty um, busy for the hour. So we'll kind of go from there. And if I have time afterwards, I will go and answer, you know, extraneous questions that don't have anything to do with the chat um, and go from there. Also, keep in mind, next Monday there will not be a live chat. I will be in Costa Rica teaching a clinic um so excited at la finca so um shout out to leo muñoz i'm very excited to teach a clinic there so it'll be so much fun um at any rate so the biggest thing you know it's 2018 obviously we're in january um many of us are sort of you know a lot of us aren't going to you know going down south and training so i know it's the first i know my good friend Catherine coleman told me that this weekend upcoming weekend is the first show of the season for a lot of us eventers um that are in florida i'm not in florida personally so um i'm sort of commiserating with the rest of us that are kind of stuck at home and sort of thinking about how the rest of this year is going to play out so i kind of wanted to talk about that and um and sort of walk you guys through how I am thinking about how my show season is going to go this year because this is the first time in 15 years that I have not gone to Florida. Um, yes, I'm very spoiled. Um, and yes, guys, I will save this on my story. Every every story um, or every live chat that I do, I'm going to save it to my story so it will go on for the next 24 hours. On top of it, I am saving it. Um, onto my phone and I'm working with a tech savvy friend of mine um, and we're going to try to upload all my stories to YouTube so that everybody can go back to them at a later time to refer to them and I will put titles up of what we spoke about so you can you don't have to just like randomly scroll through the, these lay chats. So um, let me talk to you guys first about um, sort of where I am with my goals with my horses. So as you guys know Al's retired um, from upper level eventing but um, he is doing really well. He's super sound, as many of you guys saw. Um, he was wild in his lunge work. And by the way, I am at my um, boyfriend's house, Sam, um, and he's in Virginia Beach. So my birds are back at home being babysat by Elise and Sarah. Thanks, guys, for babysitting for, for me. Um, and so I'm in um, Sam's, it's weird to say, but I'm in Sam's bedroom right now. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, because he's busy making dinner for us and his dog's in the living room and, um, they're watching TV and I wanted to keep it quiet. So, um, hence why I'm sort of got the bad angle. I would never take selfies at this angle. So my bad. Anyway, back to work. So sort of going on with, um, how I set goals. And again, usually when I'm in Florida, like I've set my goals way, way, way earlier in advance. Um, and the goals sort of just come to me. Um, I was speaking with one of my students, Karina, earlier today, and, and actually this is my first time in a long, long time that Rolex is not one of my spring goals. So usually, um, you know, when you, when you have FEI horses, you have a spring three-day and a fall three-day. Um, you know, this is a, a first time in a long time that Rolex, is kind of sad, um, isn't one of my goals this year. Um, I will be there. I will be there helping out my one of my best friends, Lisa Wallace, and um, I will definitely be doing some meet and greets and whatnot. But I won't be there competing, and I probably won't be there for a while competing because, um, you know, Patrick and Comet are still quite young and quite, um, you know, I shouldn't say new to the sport. They're not new to the sport, but they're, you know, two star and one star level, so we got some time to go. At any rate, all right, um, so working, working back. So what I normally do in setting my goals is I take a calendar and I actually get a, um, a physical calendar. Um, Platinum sends me amazing calendars and, um, and I suggest to you guys, as, as dorky and cliche as it sounds, get one of those calendars, either like, either one that like Platinum puts out or I'm sure like Bit of Britain puts out one, one that has, or, or even one that has great motivational quotes, but something like each month that you look forward to turning the month over, 
um, that you see a really great, either a really great horseback rider um, or a great sports person. It could be a football, if you're, if you're into following football or whatever floats your boat. Um, some, some of you guys, I'm really big into motivational quotes. Um, so anything like that, that sort of gets you kind of going. Get a calendar, a physical calendar. I write all of my clinics down on that. I write all of my shows on that. And I have, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably talk about these things a couple times because this is going over a lot of my questions too. But what I do is I set my goals for my own personal horses. So I worked from the very end of the year, end of 2018. So, and I have now my dressage horses and I have my eventing horses. Um, so the end goal for my eventing horses would be a fall three day. Um, and my fall three day, I'm gonna choose between either uh, the Ocala two star or Fair Hill two star for both my horses. Um, so working back from there, I start to set, set, set my show schedule. So I'm looking at plantation. I wanna go to um, a couple shows that have atmosphere. So knowing, those, knowing the show circuit on the East Coast, the shows that ha have atmosphere are shows like Plantation, um, you know, Richland's no more, um, but shows like Millbrook. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hit up those shows that have a little bit of um, atmosphere simultaneously going to shows because I don't want to always go to you know tough competitions. I want to scale back for the horses, um, and I want to go to they're not easier by any means, but shows that have a little less atmosphere, less pressure, shows like Waradaka, shows like Seneca Valley, um, like Lockmoy, love the Lockmoy shows. Um, so that's sort of how I, I plan my schedule with my horses. With my dressage horses, my ma main goal is Devon, so that's at the end of September. Um, and so I work back from there. I wanna do a couple CDIs. And again, guys, these are so subject to, to change, it's not even funny. You don't know how many times I have had an end goal and how many different options. I might have achieved that end goal, but I have gone, I have had like plan A, I've gone through plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D to get to that end goal. Sometimes my end goal has even changed for that year and I've had to push it back a year. Um, and sometimes it hasn't. But with horses, as we all know, life is fleeting, T times are changing. so. Always make sure that you are very open in your mindset on um, on what sort of um, on what on how flexible you are and and getting there. And if the time isn't right, the time isn't right. So um, and if you if you aren't feeling, you could be you could be as prepared as you are and and on paper. But if you mentally aren't prepared for the the end goal, it's not worth going. Right? Like mental preparation for me above anything um, is, is, is key. Um, and probably more important, more important than what's on paper. And I'm gonna give you guys, before I go into your questions, a little example. Rolex in 2016 with Al. Um, how many Rolexes in, did Burley had I done before then? I think I had done eight, okay? Eight, four stars. And the weeks prior, and, and, and even leading up to that, I had a great lead up. I was fifth in the three star. Um, but for some reason, I just like, I didn't have a good preparation. I, I didn't do very well in the jumper derby. I had three poles down with Al there. Um, that was at Scotty Keach's place. And then I had um, three poles down at the the two weeks before at the thing that um, the pop show does at the, at the Florida Horse Park. And I was in a really bad mental state. Um, I remember poor Lauren having to give me some like, she was like, oh my God, this lady's flipping out. I mean, honestly, the, I'm not kidding you when I say, and I, like, I'm, I'm letting you guys, I'm letting you guys in here, okay, when I tell you this. The, week, the Saturday before cross country at Rolex, Al and I were having refusals at training level, training level corners, okay? I literally had to take a knee I had to get off and tell Buck, look, this is, I, I can't do it. I'm freaking out. I had to reread Mind Gym. I was a disaster. Okay. I was a total, I was like, I can't do this. I had to get my mind back together. I had to go back to square one. And luckily, you know, with our preparation leading up to it, I could do that in 24 hours, you know, um, because we had great preparation for years on years on years. And, and once I was able to mentally get myself prepared and go back to reading 
reading my books and and watching I'm like I said like I have to watch my videos of myself riding at my best um I have like a, I literally have a compilation on my phone as gross as it sounds it really does help me um and I watch those I watch those videos I watch my Burley ride I watched my Rolex rides I watched my Carolina rides and I had the best, I mean, I don't even know where I pulled that out from. I don't know where Al came. I mean, it was the best Kentucky ride in 2016 I'd ever had. Not my dressage, that was also good. But the cross country and the show jumping was the best we'd ever done in, my, in our lives in, in the poorest conditions. Um, and again, so, so it, like I said, going back, you can have these goals, but if you're mentally not prepared, like I said, you can be prepared on paper all day long, but you've got to continually work on your mental game. That is something that is a constant, that is not given, that is not something that is that just comes easily. Okay? So and and it's not just that is not just for any amateur Joe Schmo down the street. That is for the top riders. That is for I'm sure any NFL player, any NBA player, I'm sure that's for Michael Phelps. Imagine, imagine the pressure Michael Phelps is under to win you know, nine gold medals, not seven, because if you only got seven, that would be a disappointment. I mean, imagine the pressure those people had to go through. So it is, it is, it is an ongoing struggle. And I shouldn't say struggle because that, that gives you a, a negative connotation. But um, you are only as good as your mental prowess. And for me, for Buck, for Philip. That is something that everybody is continually working on and your horses read that and the second that al read that i was unconfident he put the brakes on right and um and i can't blame him he's got to i've got to believe in him and if, if i'm not believing in us he's not going to believe in us and the second that i did it showed through to a clear round on cross country a double clear round and show jumping um and so let that be a lesson it certainly was a lesson for me and i hope that that lesson of me shows through to you guys so now, um, with that being said, um, let's go on to some of our, our um, questions here. Um, and I had, a, let's see here. So this is a great question. Someone asked me, do you recommend setting your goal as the one that is most likely that you can, that for sure you're going to make? Or, or do you think that you should sort of set your goal for something that's a little bit out of reach? And again, that's sort of... Um, Going back to what I said, having a lot of different plans for the week. So go back to your physical calendar. And even if you could write it in a couple of different colors, um, I go to the very end of the year. So if you have, if you're doing FEI already and you, in your goal and you're wanting to do, let's for instance, you're a training level rider. Okay. And your goal is to do prelim by the end of the year, right? you find a good a good prelim so if you're in area two i always think the best prelim to to go to for your for your first prelim is virginia horse trials in november it's a great prelim it's a great cross country course it's i don't i think it's i think it's challenging enough but it's fair it's a good venue um the footing is usually pretty good um well organized and you work back from there right how many trainings do you need to get by how many trainings do you need to do um, I do always start my horses off with, um, that are at a certain level. So like my training horses, unless they are uber confident, I would usually take them to one novice before I move them back to training level. Um, last year I took Patrick to one training level. Actually, I took him to two training levels because he's such a careful horse. Even though he had done prelim, the, the, he'd finished with prelim the year before, before I broke my shoulder, I didn't start him at prelim. I, um... I um, started him back at training um, till he was super, super, super confident and ready to go. Again, it's really to each their own. It's based on your horse. But for me, I'd rather my horse be too bored with the level um, than feel, especially your first couple events out, whoa, this is too much, lady, right? You want them to be zealous and weren't wanting more. Like, yo, this is easy. Let's keep going. Um, so for me, I'm go big or go home. You know, the biggest thing that I would recommend to this person that asked me about, about reaching, you know, should I plan for something that's a bit out of reach? You know, go for it, girl. Like plan A, plan B. You're probably going to go to plan C. You might even use plan D or plan E, right? Have all of your options spelled out. And guess what? You might even make your plan A, but you might have different ways of getting to plan A that might, that might not be your original plan. And that's okay. So, like I said, you go to your end of your year goal, 
right? Let's say that's prelim, for instance. Let's say it's Virginia Horse Trials prelim. And let's say that we've done, we've only done a couple trainings last year. And you work back from there, right? How many trainings do you feel that you really need? Let's, I'm gonna throw a number out, five. We wanna do five trainings, right? Even though you've got a couple in your belt, wanna do five trainings, awesome. Hey, let's say you wanna throw a training level three day in there, cool. Um, get all those things out, write them out, you know, make sure you've got enough time to incorporate a couple jumper shows in there, a couple dressage shows in there. Um, you know, give yourself, give yourself some downtime to be able to stay at home or go to some, throw in some clinics there. Um, you know, give yourself enough time to be able to focus, you know, at home and learn after your shows and, um, and take what you've learned, the things that you learned from your show and be able to work on it. Um, I do like to pair a lot of my shows, like in the summer, the great thing about coming to area two, um, for those of you that don't have the luxury of being able to compete every weekend, um, you know, going to like the Lockmoy shows, I love being able to take my horses the lower level the first weekend, like um, training level the first weekend, and then bump them up to prelim the next weekend because it's fresh in their mind. They're thinking about cross country. You know, it's, it's, they're all, they're doing, they're done in one day. Um, so I always believe that the horses, you know, they're a little tired after they learn a lot more. Um, they're, they're, they get to get turned out that night. Um, I love the one days, but the, if you can sort of pair your shows a little, clump them a little bit more together and then you know, take a look, and then after you've clumped like four shows within, I don't know, two months time, then have an, a whole month of doing either like schooling shows or clinics or just taking all that you've learned from those four shows of what you need to work on so that the next couple months you can, you can test what you did in those, in that one month of fixing all those problems. Does that make sense? Um, so that's what I would say is shoot for the stars right? Go, go big or go home. If you don't make it, it's okay. But if you don't set your goals um, to a high enough expectation, what are you going to reach for, right? Like, if I never, if I never thought I was going to, I mean, who was I to think I was going to go to Rolex on a thousand dollar horse, right? Who was I to think that, right? But I, but I dreamed about it. I dreamed about it since a little kid. And, right, like, the, it started with a dream. And as a cliche and as stupid as it sounds, it's real, right? You got it, it all starts with having that dream and, and, and setting your, and setting your mindset on something. And like I said, when I was young, um, my, you know, my goal has always been to go to the Olympics. It's still that, that goal has still evaded me and I will one day hopefully get there. Um, but when I was young, I, I woke up, I had a, I had a big poster of the 96 Olympic team, um, and it, hung on the ceiling of my of my bedroom so that the last thing I saw when I went to bed was that poster the first thing I saw when I woke up was that poster so that was a constant reminder for me um and that would be something that I would suggest for any one of you right put hang up on your ceiling what, what your goal is for that year even for that year even if it's prelim put a big poster of a of a prelim jump or a tracaner or of of write the word prelim or of a horse trials if it's virginia horse trials or if it's um um uh what's the one in um otter creek you know something one one of those big horse trials that you or millbrook put it on your put it on your wall put it on not even on your wall put it on your ceiling so that you wake up and you see that every day it's the last thing you see when you go to sleep first thing you see when you wake up um mental mental power is huge guys mental power is huge um and and you know go from there and again any questions that i don't get to today i'm 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 seeing what you guys are asking me here but if i just answer what you guys are asking me i won't be able to get to the other questions that i've laid out i will get to them and if i don't get to them dm me i will i will answer you okay because there's a lot of questions that i see here that are really really good but i i have to do these questions first that i've already planned out okay so there's that um let me see here. Next question. How do you get your event horse started in a fitness program after they've been off for a long time? What's the best way to build up fitness so that they're ready for the event season? Great question. I'm going to take a long time to answer this, so be ready here. Um, so 
Um, I'm going to talk about sort of what we've been doing with our horses. Uh, even like, so we had, our horses had about a, a week off. Actually, let me rewind for a minute. Every, after the last show of the season, okay? After the last show of the season, all of my horses, I pull their shoes. Every one of them, except Al. Al doesn't get his shoe pulls, be, shoes pulled because I want him to have the support with his shoes. Um, but every one of my horses, my big time horses, um, that, so Spartan, Comet, um, Patrick, shoes pulled, right? Does a couple things. A, makes me give them a break, right? I can't, okay, Lainey, they have vacation. They deserve the vacation. They've been working since January. They didn't get any breaks. They've been competing a lot. They'd done a ton, you know, two stars, one stars. They deserve the break, right? So I pull their shoes. It's great for the horses, for the horse's feet. Um, and I, and it's, and it's your farrier should thank you. Um, their feet get healthier. They get stronger. And it's good for the, for the horse's mind to get a little bit of a break, okay? And I'm not saying to give them six months off, right? But they all got a solid month off, um, solid month and a half off. And then my horses still don't have their shoes on, okay? I'm bringing them back to work, still don't have their shoes on. Their shoes get put on next week. Um, it makes me bring them, and, and you, as you guys can tell, from judging from my, um, my Snapchats, my horses are all back into work. It having their shoes off as I bring them back into work, it makes me bring them back into work slowly so that I can't overdo it. Not that I would, but it's just, it's just a good gauge. So, um, it makes me do a lot more flat work to begin with, um, trot sets to begin with, take it slowly so that I can't go into jumping or doing anything too crazily, um, you know, too soon to risk any injury. Um, so they will get their shoes put on next week and then I will start begin the jumping process and the whole bit. But, so that's the little tidbit. I learned that from Buck. Um, he pulls all of his shoes off. It's a thing. A lot of, a lot of the European riders do that. If your horse has an injury, you know, a big injury that they shouldn't have there, you know, again, you should consult your vet. Um, but you know, like I said, and I consult my vet, but again, my horse, those guys are young and that's why Al does not get his shoes pulled off. He's an older dude. He's had injuries. He doesn't need his shoes pulled off. He needs the support. The rest of my horses, they're off. Okay. Um, so what we did to bring my horses back, um, aside from the hacking bit, like a lot of my guys got hacked. Um, but as far as the working part, this is, I'm not going into like rebuilding the muscle part. I'm, I'm talking about like, okay, we've started hacking, gotten the horses going. Um, they've got a little bit of wind built back up. Again, I never give my horses longer of actually no riding, longer than a month off. Um, I think a month is good. I think anything longer than that, I think then you begin to lose muscle. It says 30 days for a horse to lose um, condition, endurance conditioning. So after 30 days, they begin to lose that. I don't want to lose that. Um, so anyhow, um, what I do is we begin with the lunging process. I'm a huge advocate of lunging. Um, and I cannot tell you enough about that. I'm going to actually stay on this for about 10 minutes. I'm going to teach you guys sort of what I know a little bit about lunging. Cause this was an, also another question that someone asked me about lunging exercises, how to lunge the whole bit. If you don't ha know how to lunge and don't kid yourself, Lunging is not trot, canter, halt. No, it's not spinning the horse around. Don't think that lunging is to tire your horse out to ride them. Lunging is a make or break thing. It is very, it can easily be the way that you break your horse, people, okay? It is something that I see, it drives me bonkers because I see probably more people improperly lunge a horse then properly lunge a horse okay i it drives me absolutely nuts to see people spin their horses around in a small circle i just see ligaments being torn i see horses minds being blown it is complete opposite of what lunging process is all about the whole process of lunging is teaching a horse connectivity is building up its 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 top line their weird top line that's that there's this weird thing that evades us sometimes it's called top line um to teach a horse how to use its body without us on it, okay? There's these things called vocal commands, right? It's a thing, it is a thing that people don't use. Horses do not speak English, but what horses do 
like dogs, they understand they understand enunciations and, and the pitch of a person's voice. So when you scream at your horse, canter, canter, they don't get that. Canter, when your voice gets higher pitched, that means to go faster, right? So when you tell your horse to go, if you want your horse to go faster, your voice should go and to rut on, right? When you want your horse to go faster, there should be a higher pitch. When you want your horse to go slower, not ho, no, and sla, ha, ho. Notice how my voice went down, right? Teaches your horse to go slower, right? Those are called those are called vo vocal commands, right? And in your horses should you should teach them, right? Your horses should teach them. Um, so, going back to the lunging process, when you lunge a horse, a, please learn. If you don't know how to lunge, ask somebody that does. I will even volunteer myself to maybe do a live during one of maybe. Um, next week or when I get back from Costa Rica, I will do a live on teaching you guys how to lunge. It'll have to be in the middle of the day, so I know a lot of you guys are in school. Um, and yes, my mom is legit and amazing at lunging. Um, and and you guys can, and I'll save it and you guys can watch it at a later time. But it, it, is, it is extremely, an extremely important tool that I see so many people abuse, use and abuse. Um, and so what we do when we bring my horses back is I usually do, a good three days, two to three days of free lunging, people, free lunging, right? We're not putting contraptions on them, okay? So someone just asked me about the Pessoa thing. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. No, no. We're not going to teach the horse how to stretch by using contraptions, right? I, um, yeah, I know. Danny's letting me go on vacation. Um, we're not going to teach the horse to stretch by putting a contraption on it because when you take the contra contraption off, he'll not know how to stretch. So, a um, couple thing, couple aids on teaching hor horse how to stretch on the lunge line, and he will not be pu will not put a contraption, i.e., side reins or sur single, on the horse until the horse offers a stretch on the lunge line. Okay. So, according to my dressage trainer, who what who worked at the Spanish Riding School in Vienna for a year who is the best lunge, lunge person I've ever met and who I've learned all of my lunging from. Um, and my mother, who is also amazing, who she learned her lunging from Radu. Um, free lunging is lunging the horse on the, on the lunge line and with just your lunge whip, right? Which is, which is your leg, right? It's not to whip the horse. You don't use the lunge whip to whip the horse, okay? It's just your leg. It's, it's seen as your leg aid to push the horse forward. Um, and your lunge line. Now, how you connect the lunge line on the free lunge. Usually you just connect it easily on the inside part of the bit, okay? We're doing this on a, with a bridle, okay? Um, or if a horse that is really bad about throwing his shoulder out, you have the option to take the lunge line and go through the inside bit and connect it to the outside, the part of the bit, okay? Through the bit of the inside part and connect it to the outside, okay? Um, you have that option. I have, I don't have any horses that I have to use that option on. So very rare will you need that. So always start with trying just putting on the inside part of the bit, okay? Now, the free lunge part. For a lot of forward and back, a lot of forward and back, pushing the horse forward in the canter, forward in the trot, a lot of transitions from trot to walk. Um, spiraling your circle in, spiraling your circle out, spiraling the circle into letting the horse get, get to letting the horse get slower. And then when you ask the horse to spiral out, pushing the trot forward, only when your horse offers the stretch, like I said, without using any side reins, without using any Pessoa rigs, then you can then think of using those rigs. But he has to first understand how to stretch on his own. If he does not know how to stretch on his own, you will never have a horse that understands how to um, how to stretch over a jump, right? How to stretch through his back to offer you a good medium gait. So I'm doing you a favor. Teach your horse how to free lunge first, okay? Do it. Um, another great way to teach your horse how to stretch is on the free lunge, use of pulls. So using three cavalettis, they don't need to be elevated, okay? Um, use, uh, put three poles on the ground, separate them. You can put like anywhere, um, you, like take your feet, your actual feet and step five to six steps, okay? Um, 
And the actual act of having to stretch his legs to get through those, he will have to stretch his neck down, right? So that's a great way of incorporating that and teaching the horse to stretch. So again, it took, we did three days of, of, of free lunging work and then we put the sur singles on, okay? Now, I connect my sur single um, for all of my horses on the low, my side reins go on very, very loosely. I think it was maybe on like the fifth hole. Evenly, evenly, I will say that one more time, evenly on each side of the sur single. So the lowest ring of the sur single, my side reins went on evenly, okay? Um, and I, this is how I connect my my um, lunge line and I want you guys to really pay attention to this I take the lunge line I go through the I go through the inside bit okay and then I take the lunge line and I connect it at the very top of the sur single on the inside okay so if I'm the horse and you're looking at me from the side here's my bit I take this I take the lunge line and I connect it through the bit and I go up to the up to the sur single and on the top ring, I connect it. What that does is it takes, there's no direct pressure on the bit and it creates an inside flexion, right? And as your whip pushes your horse out, the flexion comes to the rib cage of the horse. It doesn't pull a direct pull on the inside part of the bit. Does that make sense? Um, so that's, that's what we wanna do. Oh, great question. Estimate how long the, thank you. Thank you, A. Sarles. Thank you, Amanda, for that. Um, I think that's Amanda um, for asking. My sessions last in the beginning when bringing your horse back, 20 minutes at the most, at the most. Your three lunging sessions, maybe 20 minutes, okay? Um, then with a sur single on, because I always start, I never start with a sur single on. Um, I first begin free lunging and then I put the sur single on. Um, so I'll start without the sur single. Oh, I'll, I'll, the sur single will be on the horse, okay? Um, and then, but I won't connect the side reins. So I'll free lunge with the sur single on, um, and but I'll still and I'll still connect the the lunge line just to the inside of the bit, um, and I'll I'll warm them up each direction, and then I'll put the side reins on, and then connect through the inside bit, the top of the sur single. Again, spiraling the circle in, incorporating, and usually the third or fourth day of lunging, I will then incorporate the poles, okay? Um, if you have a horse that you still, after the third day, you're still not offering the stretch, incorporate the poles sooner, okay? You guys know your horse, I don't. Sort of go with that. Um, then, if you have a horse that you wanna start, and you wanna start to do some flat work with, um, another good tip, put your sur single over your saddle. So I have a horse Matisse at home, my, one of my dressage horses, um, that wants to be a little bit, um, he has connectivity issues, so, and he really understands the connection in the lunge line. So before I get on him, I throw the sur single over the saddle and I free lunge him one direction, put the side reins on the next direction, do the next direction, then I get on him. It makes my work so much easier. Um, he's already warmed up, loose, seeking the contact, so then I get on him, my work is easier. Um, so that's another idea. Then, guys, going back to the original question of how, so I just, I wanted to take that time um, so I could tell you guys about the lunging thing, because that's a huge pet peeve of mine. A lot of my working students, a lot of my grooms that come to me, I don't let them lunge. I, and in just this year, Kelly and Elise, Greg, um, like I had to really vet them on lunging and, and I'm, and like I had, I had, because before I never let anybody lunge for me because I just couldn't, I couldn't stand how people lunge. And, and it's just, and it's not because people don't want to know. It's because people just don't, no one, no one teaches people how to lunge. It's just assumed. And so, and you know what, that's professionals like my own fault. So I'm gonna do a better job and I'm gonna teach you guys how I do it. Whether you guys wanna learn or not, guess what, you don't have to watch if you don't want to. But it's, it's, it, it really is something that it is, it is, a, it is a training process that, that 
is not utilized enough. It's just not. Um, and it is something that I see people do to tire horses out as opposed to train horses. Um, and as they're tiring their horses out, all they're doing is br slowly breaking their horses, not just physically, but mentally. And I can't stand it. Um, so I will, um, I will do, I will definitely do a better job of that and I will incorporate it and I will do lives even during the day. Even if you guys can't see it or you're working, you guys can refer back to it. Okay. Um, so going back to the fitness program, you know, like I said, before I start jumping, I will be doing this stuff when my horses get their shoes on. I'll probably ride in about a week, do some flat work, do some trot sets, and then I'll start to incorporate my jumps. Um, what I'll usually do, I suggest, I highly suggest for your first three or four times back to jumping, doing your grid work, right? Any of my grids, guys. I had a girl ask me today, what grid would I start with? Any of them. Revise them. Make them yours. What mine, what's mine is yours. Um, you know, if you've got a horse, you know, again, I can't say what you guys should, should or should do because I don't know you guys. Of course, my students, I can tell them what to do. But if I don't know you or your horse, you sort of have to take the responsibility for that part. Um, so some of you may need to trot your horse in. You know, some of my horses need to trot in the first time because they're wind, they're super stoked to trot. Or they're super stoked to jump. So they're going to be like a bat out of hell taken off. Um, you know... But the biggest thing I can't stress to you enough for all of my horses, no matter what their level, how green they are, they will start with grid work. Um, as you see, a lot of my courses that I share with you guys are grids, incorporated with courses, finishing with grids, okay? Um, so I will always start with grids. I will always finish with grids. And you will see a lot more grid work um, in, in, my, in my what I'm sharing in this beginning of the year versus what I do at the in the middle of the year, right? Because in the middle of the year when we're showing, we're doing coursework. Do I always, there is not a single time in my life that I have ever warmed up without a grid. Any, any, any time. I always, want, whether it's a simple nine foot rail to a vertical with a landing rail, and then I go into a course, there is never a time that I do not do a grid to warm up. It might be something as simple as that. It might be more of a complex grid and then take that into a course in the middle of the year. But I always, always start with a grid because what I feel is that that gets my horse into a good shape over the jumps, um, creates good habits on my part and the horse's part, and it only helps us for the coursework down the long road. Same thing with what we're working on right now. We're just starting the year off. You don't want your horse to, to, if you had old habits in the past, the horse rushed, your horse stopped, let's get him into good habits now in the new year, right? So if your horse, let's, for instance, wants to rush, put his ass, sorry, put his bum into grids, right? Put his bum into grids. Um, if your horse has a propensity to be behind the leg, put his bum into grids, right? Start and end your day with grids. If your horse gets nervous with grid work, like this HG eventing is asking me, all the more reason to do more of them. Start, if you need to walk over, some horses get nervous with a lot of poles. Walk through poles, like put, I'm not saying that you need to, what you guys are seeing with the, like for instance, the last, the last grid that I built, the horses didn't start with that. The grid was not the cross rails with the vertical. They didn't start with that. If you saw how I started it, Everything, the cross rails were literally six inches tall we, so that the horses could build into that and understand the question. And then we built the crosses with the verticals. We don't just start with it built crazy big, guys, okay? We're not, I'm not a mass kiss. I don't want to, my goal for every horse that I ride, for every lesson that I teach, for every student that I teach, both equine and human, is to not steal confidence, is to create confidence, right? Through challenge through easy work, through both, right? It's gotta be a sandwich effect. You wanna challenge your horse, right? You wanna make, I want every one of my students to leave that arena having had nerves, God, God this is really hard, but leaving that arena thinking, wow, I, I really accomplished a lot today, right? And there's a way, there's a way to do that, right? There's, you're not gonna get there by not challenging yourself. You have to challenge yourself so that you feel like you've accomplished something, but you can't just start with it built up crazy high and not accomplish anything because you're stopping at it, right? So there's a balance, okay? Does that answer everybody, everybody's question, I hope? Um, incorporating your trot sets for your endurance. So your dressage, your lunge work first before you're anything. Um, your trot sets for endurance. I would do at least two trot sets a week. 
start with start with 15 minute trot sets, okay? What I mean by trot sets, trotting without stopping. Um, for my guys that are confined to just indoors, um, you're gonna have a little bit of a revised thing because you can't really do, you're gonna have to, one person I would follow is Elisa Wallace um, because you have to think really outside the box. We at least, okay, we're a little bit confined inside with the snow, but it's melted now. So we can now go back outside. You guys are in the snow for like months on end. So you guys are gonna have to think a little bit more outside the box. Elisa, she doesn't even know I'm talking about her right now, um, but Elisa does has really good fun games that you can do with your horses and you can't make, you can't, you wanna build a relationship with your horse over these winter months so that when you go to compete them, they're trusting you, not like, okay, get the hell off my back. I can't stand to see your face any longer. And um, I've really been retweeting um, on Twitter a lot of what Elise has been posting about fun games um, of trust with her horse. She doesn't ride the horses every single day. I see her with Johnny teaching him how to ground tie and how to, and those are things that you can do um, if you are confined to an indoor. Um, and so, Instead of teaching your horse how to have a collected canner or a walk to canner or a flying change one day, you can teach him how to ground tie. You can teach him how to um, how to trust you more, but do things that are on the ground. You can you can desensitize him to a flapping umbrella, but things that make it fun, right? Things that make it fun. So that's another idea. Okay. So again. It should take you all in all to get your horse back into full fitness program, a full eventing fitness program at the most a month and a half, right? Um, and I'm not saying advanced level, but I'm saying, you know, jumping courses, feeling like you've, your, your horse is fit enough to go out and do a training level, you know, and like I said, this is being able to do trot sets, okay? I'm not talking about, I'm talking about being in Virginia. Um, take us about like a month and a half. Um, so like I said, my first event is in March. So my horses will start, um, jumping when I get back from Costa Rica. Um, and that's, uh, not next week because I'm going to be gone next week in Costa Rica, or I should say this week. Um, it's the week after. So take that for what it's worth. Uh, all right. So last question or no, two questions. How do you get the most of your season when your farm only allows you to go to four events? That's tough, um, but I've got a, I've, I do have an answer for that after thinking about it, because I first said, well, why don't you just go to a different farm? But there are a lot of places that your whole season is just four events, right? Because, because it's seasonal. Um, and my biggest, my biggest um, answer to that would be, think outside the box here, right? So there are ways to bring the horse show to you. And that is, and I, and I, there's no sponsorship here. I'm just saying this because I think it's a freaky, freaky, brilliant idea. But the better dressage show, better dressage scores .com, They also have an Instagram page, and I'm plugging them only because for no other reason than the fact that I think it's a brilliant, brilliant idea. I wish I thought of it. You take a video of your dressage test, okay, people? They have their show dates. I think they spell it out. I don't know exactly even how it works, but. They have their show dates spelled out on their um, on their website or on their Instagram. And during their show dates, you send out I think it's like twenty five bucks or it's 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 not it's a nominal fee. You have someone video your dressage test, the test that you're going to send in, um, and you send that video in. And they have a judge. It's they're they're I think there are rated judges. They're they're rated judges that place you and score you. I think that is freaking brilliant. I know I'm going to do it, right? I know I'm going to do it. Um, and I'm going to do it throughout my whole show season. So I don't even have the excuse of not being able to show, but I think it's a great way to get eyes on you. And I don't want to, and I don't want to have to put my horse to the stress of traveling to the show. I don't have time to go to all these different shows. Um, you know, another thing, if you, if you don't have the, if you can't go to the, the, all the recognized shows, let's say you're, your trainer just doesn't want to go to a bunch of shows. You can only pick four. Make those four count. So the so the way you can make those four count is by f doing the better dressage show, sc scores .com, right? Um, going to schooling shows, right? Um, going to as many clinics as you can, so that when you step foot, when you step foot on the soil of those four recognized events, you are the best version. You and your horse are the best version of yourself. Okay. Um, 
you know, and, and, last, and, and worst comes to worst, speak with your coach and tell them what your goals are. If your goals are to go to Rolex and your coach's goals are to stay at beginner novice, then maybe, just maybe, it's time to seek another coach. And I would hope that that coach would agree with you, right? Like if I have students that their goal is to go to beginner novice level and now I will teach anybody of any level, but they want somebody that wants to remain at, at beginner novice level, then I am very, very happy to set, to tell them a coach that will be a better coach for them. Maybe I'm not the right coach for them. At the end of the day, a good coach wants to see, a, the best coaches are not the ones that want to see themselves, make you, make see themselves look good. They want to see you succeed. And if that means, if that means that it's not under them and they have, they know of someone better or they can move you on to someone better, to me, that's the best coach, right? The ones that want to see you succeed under anybody, including them. And if it doesn't mean them and they know of somebody else that you can be better under, that's a good coach, right? So that's an option too, okay? Um, the, the website of the dressage video, and it's also on Instagram. So obviously everybody has Instagram on here. It's um, betterdressagescores.com, okay? Or betterdressagescores is the Instagram handle, okay? Um, and last, the last question, right? I've got less than 15 minutes on here. Um, the last question that someone sent to me was, how do you train off the horse, okay? Um, well, I used to do the weightlifting thing. I used to do, I, I actually do run every now and then. Um, hey, Karina. Um, but what I do, in, in, and all those things are great. All those things are awesome. Um, hold on one second, guys. Guys, you guys just, I need you to go out. Out, 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 out. Let's go. Sorry about that. Had a dog break in the door here. <laughs> so, um, what I do is hot yoga and it's hot vinyasa yoga. It's not Bikram yoga. Don't get it confused with Bikram yoga because I want, a, and I'm not to say that Bikram yoga isn't a workout. Um, but I want, um, I want to get my heart rate up to, to not just lose weight, but to improve my, um, my core strength, to improve my heart rate, to improve, to burn weight, to burn calories, blah, blah, blah. So I do hot vinyasa yoga, and I do it about two to three times a week. Um, I don't do it as much in the summer. I don't do it actually at all in the summer because it's way too hot. I'm riding 10, 11 horses a day, so that's when I really get into nutrition. Um, I'm still doing my nutrition now, um, and I'm seeing a nutritionist. I see a nutritionist um, once every six weeks. Um, I used to do once a week, especially in Ocala, I'd see a nutritionist. Um, yeah, I guess the parents is right. Um, no, here to go. Um, but I, uh, the hot yoga, I highly suggest because a lot, I've found that a lot of us horseback riders, A, um, are really unflexible for many reasons. We don't have to like, we, we are sort of one position. We want to, I hate to say that we're stiff, but we want to sort of be stiff or, I, or at least, um, quiet in the saddle. You don't want to be moving and flexible, right? So um, I'm always constantly telling people in, um, in my dressage lessons to not move your upper body so much, but to isolate the movement in your hip flexors. A lot of people are really stiff in their hip flexors and not as strong in their core. And that is what hot yoga does for me. Um, a lot of people have a hard time competing in the summer. I'm a desert lizard. I don't know if it's because of my Arabic heritage, um, but I love the heat. I thrive in the heat, so it doesn't that doesn't bother me at all. But um, it's another way to get acclimated to the summer. So if you can work out for an hour in 119 or 115, anywhere, it's anywhere from, it ranges anywhere from 105 to 115 degrees, what they do in there. Um, it, it gets you acclimated to what you're going to be expecting this summer. Not that it's anywhere near that hot, but if you can do it, um, it's, it helps. The heat for me, because I've broken so many bones, um, it helps me become more flexible. So I always leave the class being able to 
be able, being able to fulfill, fulfill more postures than what I was able to do. Like this arm from breaking it, um, the, or the shoulder, like I can only lift it this far. When I leave the class, I can lift it further. And I feel like the more I can break up that um, scar tissue, um, the more I can work it, um, the better, the better. And so, and, and on top of it, the, 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 the sheer core workout of the yoga is really helpful. Um, you don't, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going, I don't, not going to strain any bones from, or strain any muscles from doing, um, any, any, um, weight, weight training. I don't need weight training. Um, at least I don't feel like I need weight training. I, I'll probably ride in Goopy. I might need weight training, but, um, you know, for the most part, my horses are quite light in the, in the contact. Um, where I need it is really in the, in the strengthening bit of my, of my core and the flexibility in my appendages, especially from having had injuries. And, um, and it gets my heart rate up when you are, especially, I really love the poses of, um, the stability poses or the balancing poses where you have to stand in the balance and it gets your heart rate up when you have to hold the tree or the balance or the, um, the, I don't, even, I don't know what the names of them are. I just sort of go and do it. Um, when you have to hold those, the, like the standing bow or whatever it's called and, and that hot and that heat, it really gets your heart rate up and it's a great workout and I leave drenched in sweat. Um, it feels cleansing. Um, it's a great way to just get rid of all the stress from the day. Um, and the lavender, the cold, the cold lavender towels at the end are sinfully amazing. Okay. Sinfully amazing. I highly suggest it. Okay. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I follow a lot of, um, a lot of writers, like top writers on Instagram. Catherine Dufour is one of them. Um, and I know, I know she's big into weight training. She's a dressage rider, a uh, Swedish dressage rider, phenomenal rider. Um, there's a, another girl that's from, I, I think Netherlands. That's a jumper rider that's in Wellington now. She's big into doing a lot of, um, strength training. Um, and th so they're doing a lot of weights, you know, again, it's really to each their own. It's to each their own, but, um, rest assured there, there is a lot going on outside of the saddle and not just the working out part. It's what, what you're putting in your mouth too, right? Um, the sessions last depends on what class you take. There's hot flow, there's hot yin, um, there's hot stability class. Um, and so some of them are 45 minutes. The candlelight ones are cool. Some of them are 75 minutes. Um, and some of them are 60 minutes. So I'm doing a class tomorrow. Um, that's 60 minute long hot stability. And then I'm doing hot flow. That's 60 minutes long on Wednesday. So yeah, they're just things that I really want that I really look forward to. Karina, I'll take you next time. And, um, they're just great mentally. Uh, they're great to check out for that, for that hour. Um, and focus on yourself. It's yoga is a great, it's, it's the, it's, I guess yoga is the act of finding stillness in your body and what is riding all about. You want to be a still quiet rider, right? And so I feel like that is a way to find stillness. If I can find stillness in myself alone, I'll have a better means of finding it on my horse, right? Um, especially if I get really frustrated, if I can't quite get my tempi changes on Diego, or if I can't quite get the striding down on Comet, or, you know, it, I have to go back to the, the sort of whole mindset that yoga offers and teaches you. Um, and I really appreciate that. And I think it's a great, um, I think it's a great way of life that the yogis offer. And I think it's, it can't hurt, right? So anyhow, that is the end of, um, of today, uh, of today's session. And, um, you know, I hope this helped. I hope this gets you guys on your path of finding what your goals are for 2018. Like I said, I'm with, I'm in the same boat as you guys, you know, I'm sort of a little bit behind the eight ball. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Instagram. I'm looking at everybody's training sessions in Florida right now, wishing I was there. Um, but I'm going to keep putting on my grid of the days. I'm going to keep you guys going. We're in this boat together. Um, and we're going to get through it and we're going to set our goals and we're going to have plan A, plan B, plan C. And if we've got to keep going down the line, if we've got to go to plan Z, we will. Um, 
but my my mindset is this everything is everything is meant to happen we i always like to take the bull by the horn and i will make it happen if it's meant to be but you always have to the universe has a good way of telling you you have to make yourself open to the universe and, and allowing you to tell you um, what is meant to be and what's not meant to be um, and be able to push. And that is why I say to set your goals big, set them big, reach for the stars, because if you don't set them big enough, um, you'll find that your, um, your progression to getting to where you want to get is, is slow or, or may not happen, right? Um, so dream big. And, and like I said, it, it sounds so, so cliche. I get it. I totally get it. Um, but it, it really does when people say, you know, reach for the stars. And when I like, I like to sign my posters, reach for the stars, all four of them. I, I, I sincerely mean it. Like I said, it, it, it I never, I always wanted to go to a four star, right? You know, when I was young, it was sort of, oh, that's cute. Yeah. Nice little girl. Cute. Um, but I never stopped dreaming about it. You know, when I went to Rolex when I was 13, I think I went to Rolex when I was 13, I was turning 14. The next time I would be back there was when I was 20 and I was competing there. It was a long format. Oh my God, I'm so old. Um, so, you know, and that was, a, I mean, that was, that was a dream come true. That was literally a dream come true. Um, but, you know, it takes, it takes, it takes a little bit. I'm not going to lie to you guys. It takes, it takes a little finances to get there that, it doesn't take millions of dollars. It just takes, um, takes mental fortitude. It takes, um, takes support. Doesn't it takes support from family, from friends, um, from coaches. Um, it takes a good horse, a really good horse. It takes a great horse. It takes a great horse. Most importantly, it takes, it takes hard work. I will not never claim to be the best rider out there. Do I want to be the best rider? Yeah, but there's always gonna be someone that's better than you. And I'm not anywhere near the best rider. Do I want to be the best rider? Hell yeah. But you want to know what I am. You want to know what I have is I will work hard and I will work to the end of the day and I will ride another horse and I will ride any horse if that will make me get to where I need to go or help me where I need to get to go. And I know that can for you guys too. So never forget that. Okay. So until next time, I will see you guys again next Monday. I um, will not be here because I will still be in Costa Rica. Um, so the Monday after that, I will be coming back from a clinic in Charleston, South Carolina. And um, I will be there. And I will come up with a topic that we can talk about. And I'll try to make it not as long so that I can answer all of my questions. Again, I will be reposting this store, this um, live chat on my story so that everybody can see it and I will also save it and I will post it to my YouTube once I figure out how to post these to my YouTube. Um, I tried doing it last week and it was a miserable failure but um, my friend Lisa has a plan of attack to be able to post these. So I don't want to get cut off like I did last week um, and um, any good books to read about. Um, so like I said, uh, Mind Gym is one of them. Um, not t Malcolm Gladwell has a has a book. It's not Tipping Point. Tipping Point's a great book, um, but um, Outliers, Outliers, great great book, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Really really good read. I highly recommend it. Um, and then I am currently reading that You Are a Badass book. Um, and I really do like it. I really do like it. It's more for like when you've sort of hit rock bottom. Um, but I am finding, I am finding my way in it and it's answering a lot of questions for me and I'm finding, um, the answers that I need to out of it. So I do recommend that, that, that book. Um, so again, I really, I really enjoy doing these live chats. It helps me probably more than it helps you guys. Um, it's sort of a, a self-help. <laughs> um, but again, I hope it helps you guys in the process. And again, if anybody has any questions, please DM me and, um, and we'll go from there until next time, guys, stay wild, stay lit, lay squad, seize up, toodles, bye.